one whole book of the Bible. Turn to the book of Philemon. <laughs> See, there you go. If I'd have said Ezekiel, gone. <laughs> All right, Philemon. Now, this is a book that isn't often talked about, but I believe it focuses on the central piece, the central theme of the entire Bible. And that is uh, the theme and the doctrine and the subject of forgiveness. All of us at some point in time in our life, all of us at some point in time in the relationships that we currently have, um, with family, with friends, maybe even at work, at school, with teachers, have needed and maybe even asked for forgiveness. And so the question is, why is it, first of all, do we even need forgiveness as people? Why do we still need, even as members of the Lord's church, why do we still need forgiveness? And the answer to that is, because you are you and I am me. And we are flawed human beings. And what's so interesting about this book is the book is, is called Philemon, but Philemon is not really the, or, or Philemon is not really the main character. Philemon is the recipient of the letter, but the letter is actually about an indentured servant that Philemon has, who has run away from his master who has uh, encountered the Apostle Paul. And so the question becomes then, what is Paul or what is Philemon to do with this indentured servant that Paul is now going to send back to him? And so the key or the, the main point that I want us to understand this evening is this, is that you cannot have a biblical faith without practicing forgiveness. You cannot have a biblical faith without practicing forgiveness. Notice what Paul says, and look at the irony in the very first verse. It says, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ. That word there could also be translated a bondservant, a servant of Christ Jesus, or for Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother. How ironic that Paul talks to a master who has had a runaway slave and says, I too, as an apostle, am a prisoner. I too, as an apostle, am still a slave. A slave to who? A slave to Jesus Christ. And Philemon, you're a brother in Christ, and you too are a slave who has a master, and that person is Jesus Christ. The bottom line is that all of us are slaves to something. All of us are slaves to something. As Paul notes in Romans chapter 6, you're either a slave to righteousness or a slave to unrighteousness. And one way to measure that is forgiveness. How good are you and how good am I in our service to Christ Jesus in forgiving people? Is it something that comes to us naturally out of the outflow of our faith? Or is it something that when it comes time or, or someone suggests that forgiveness take place, we kind of just grind our teeth like, ugh. Or is it one of those things where we come to and someone says, man, you really should forgive that person. Well, I guess I'll forgive you because I have to forgive you. And so Paul says, you're a slave to something. To Philemon, a beloved fellow worker. Notice the unity that's there between Philemon and Paul. Paul doesn't put Philemon below him. He doesn't put Philemon above him. He says, we are equal fellow workers. And Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church that is in your house. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. I want to... He's basically saying to this guy, I want you and I, and I greet you with no malice, with no content, with no ought, but with the grace and the love and the compassion that is found in Jesus Christ, with the peace that is in God, 
our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Why is that? Maybe the undercurrent of saying that is so that he can kind of set the table for the request that he's going to make of Philemon. Just as I have greeted you with peace, just as I have greeted you with love, just as we are both equal in, in uh, the church and in the work and in the field of the Lord, I want you to be this way when it comes to the request that I am about to make. And so Paul first opens up and he sets the table with the things that they have in common with one another. One of the things that will be key for you and me when it comes time to forgive people is not to identify the differences that we might have or the ought that we might have, but the similarities that I have with you and I. Every person that you come in contact with is a couple of things. One, they're an image bearer of God. Everybody in the world, regardless of who they are, what they look like, or where they come from, have been made by God, have been made by the ruler and sustainer of the universe. And on that principle alone, we share something in common. And on that principle alone, that should encourage us that when the time comes to forgive people, that that's one of the things that we look to. Another thing that we all have in common, all people for all times and all places are sinners. Sinners. And sometimes one of the reasons it's hard to forgive is because we fail to realize that I am just as sinful, I need just as much forgiveness as the person on the other end who's wronged me. Think about this for a second. Think about all of, uh, for a split second, think about as many doctrines in the Bible that you can find or you can understand or that you know about and tell me which one of those doesn't lead back in some way to forgiveness. Hope for heaven leads back to forgiveness. Grace leads back to forgiveness. Mercy leads back to forgiveness. The crucifixion and the atonement for sin on the cross by Jesus Christ leads back to forgiveness. Why? Because in all of those doctrines, there's the understanding that people are fallen and need help. If we understand that about each other, if I understand that about the person on the other end of the conversation, the other person in the circumstances and situations that they find themselves in, it's gonna make it easier for me to forgive them and it'll make it easier for them to forgive me. So all of us are image bearers and all of us are fallen. And so Paul says, he opens that up and he says, this is what we have in common. And this is what he appreciates about Philemon. And maybe one of the things that we need to do when it time comes to forgive somebody is not to start out, this is what most times we do. When it comes time to have the difficult conversations with people, sometimes the first thing that we do is we list all of the bad things that that person's done, either to us or that we have heard about. But what does Paul do? Paul, in setting the table for this request for Philemon to forgive his indentured servant Onesimus, where does he start? He starts with the things that he appreciates about Philemon. He says, I thank God always when I remember you in my prayers. What is so amazing about Paul's writings is that when he writes to communities or he writes to people, he notes to them that they are actively being prayed for by an apostle. He says, I thank you uh, in my prayers because I hear of your love. And Philemon, I've heard about your agape love and of the faith that you have towards the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. So what does that mean? That means that for Philemon, Onesimus is also a saint. He is reminding Philemon of the love that he has for Jesus, that the love that he has for the saints, so that when he makes this request, when it comes to the servant that ran away, that he would express the same level of love that he has for the Lord and he has for the saints, for this runaway saint who happens to work for him. Let me ask this question. When it comes to the level of love that we have for one another and the people that have wronged us, is that a unbalanced scale? 
Is that an unbalanced scale? What Paul says here is, you love the Lord, you love the saints, and I need you to love Onesimus equally as you love the saints and as you love the Lord. And because that makes forgiveness easier. It doesn't take away the pain, it doesn't take away the hurt, but it makes the call and it makes the conversation and it makes the ultimate result in the long run easier for you and the person that is involved in the receiving of forgiveness. And so he says in verse six, and I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of of Jesus Christ. I want people to know about your love and I want people to know about what you've done in the place that you are so that what? The full knowledge of Jesus Christ might be done. The full knowledge of what you've done and what I've done might be known not for your sake or my sake but for the sake of Jesus Christ. Here's something that I know about people. And that you know about people. That when you are forgiven, and that when I am forgiven, and that when people are forgiven, they tell people that they've been forgiven. They tell people, you know what? That person right there, he did not. I wronged him so bad. I wronged her so bad. And they did not have to do what they did. And and sometimes it goes like this. But for some reason, I can't put my thumb on it. They forgave me. They acted in a way that was not expected. And when we do that, we do that for the sake of Christ. So that person might experience the forgiveness of Jesus Christ through our actions. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of all the saints have been refreshed through you. Look at how many compliments Paul gives Philemon. He reminds them of what they have in common. He reminds Philemon of all the great attributes and things that he has done in the church. And now he's going to make his request. He says, accordingly, because of all of these things, according to the things that we have in common, according to the good works that you've done for the saints and that you've done for the Lord, for the namesake of Jesus Christ, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do it, what is required, yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. Paul says, I could twist your arm. I could twist your arm. I could, I could take my authority as an apostle and I could say, Philemon, it's not a, a, a request. You have to do this. You will do this. And I'm going to make you do this. Paul could easily have done that. Paul says, no, I don't want to twist your arm to do this. I want to appeal to you on the basis of the things that we have in common and the love that you share in Jesus Christ. Because think about it for a second. If Paul goes to Philemon and he goes and he twists his arm, right? You know, sometimes you'll see the the cop put the guy's arm all the way up here. He goes, ah, ah, my shoulder, right? If he does that spiritually, and if he does that by the way of his words to Philemon, the question becomes, would the forgiveness of Onesimus, the runaway slave, actually be genuine? No, it wouldn't be. People would ask Philemon, well, why did you take that runaway slave back? Well, you know, big brother Paul, the apostle, you know, using all of his authority and whatnot, making me take this guy back. That could be how the conversation goes. But if it's done on the basis of love, the appeal to love for a brother, out of the goodness and the overflow of the faith that resides in Philemon's soul, Now that is a different story. That not only changes the narrative about the relationship between Philemon and Paul, it changes the narrative and the relationship between Philemon and Onesimus. And it results in change. It results in a story that's to the benefit of all of the saints where Philemon resides. 
And Paul is saying, I'm appealing to this on the basis of your faith because if you're going to have a proper faith in Jesus Christ, then forgiveness has to be a part of that. Because forgiveness, I firmly believe this, that forgiveness is the central theme and the central doctrine of the entire Bible. I mean, think about it for a second. I mean, it says in the book of Philippians that Jesus emptied himself. He didn't consider equality with God to be something to be grasped. He didn't see it as something that, man, I've got to have this on my trophy mantle, so to speak. And it's not as if God twisted Jesus' arm to go and forgive. But what if he did? What if Jesus said, you know, I'm only doing this because, you know, the Father kind of, you know, made me. That's not righteous love. That's a forced love that would make God and Jesus and the sacrifice unjust, not right, not completely loving. And this is the type, and this is not the type of love that Paul appeals to. Paul appeals to Philemon on the basis of that genuine love. And he says there, I, Paul, an old man now prisoner for Christ, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus what why are you calling him a child after all don't you know Paul of all the bad stuff that he's done don't you know that he put himself in a situation where he worked for this guy and he willfully ran away it's not like anybody freed him he willfully ran away and don't you know he stayed away and don't you know Paul that if you hadn't come across him he'd probably still be away See, that's not how Paul describes Onesimus, is it? He says, he's my child. The same phrase that he uses towards his fellow companion in the letter, Timothy in 1 and 2 Timothy. And why does he call him his child? He says, whose father I became in my imprisonment. He's not talking physically, he's talking spiritually. That came across Onesimus while I was in prison. While I was on house arrest. And we had a conversation. And ultimately he became a child of God. I became his spiritual father, so to speak. I became his spiritual mentor. And he became a son of God of the kingdom. And notice what he says here. He says, formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful for you and to me. What do you mean he was useless? He was a runaway slave. He wouldn't be able to do any work. A runaway slave is no good to a master. Oh, but now the circumstances has changed. The circumstances are now that he's not only just good to Philemon, but he's also good to Paul. What does he mean? He's going to work overtime as a slave? No, he's going to put his hand to the plow in the vineyard of the Lord. And that's the change. But still, he's got to pay the price for being a runaway slave. He just can't get off scot-free. He still has to do hard labor for the wrong that he's done to Philemon. Is that what Paul's going to say? Nope. But sometimes that's what we say. Sometimes that's what we require in order for people to be forgiven by us. I'll forgive you if. Isn't it interesting that two letters placed at the end of a sentence changes everything? Instead of it being, I'll forgive you, it's, I'll forgive you if you do A, B, C, D, E, F, G, until I'm satisfied. And in those moments, brothers and sisters, we can forget who we are and what we've received as Christians. We can forget that we're Christians and we we can forget the forgiveness that we've all received on the cross of Jesus Christ. And he says there, he says here, I am sending him back to you, sending my very 
heart. Man, it must have been a crazy change in Onesimus' life for Paul to call him a child and for Paul to say, I'm sending you my heart. It's as if I am taking all that I am, <clears throat> all that I've become, all that I stand for, and I'm imparted all of that to Onesimus, and I'm sending it to you. He is, it's as if I am sending you me. That's a bold statement. But what does that say? That shows the confidence that Paul had, one, in Philemon to do the right thing, and two, for Onesimus to, be the, to do the right thing and be the right person upon returning to Philemon. It's a confidence, not in the basis of, what, of who Onesimus used to be, but who Onesimus now was, who he promised the Lord he would be. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be my compulsion, but of your own accord. For this perhaps is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, a beloved brother. He goes, hey, is it possible, Philemon, that in the course of his running away, that that took place so that he might achieve a greater purpose and a greater role and a greater benefit to you and me? Paul's answer is, perhaps that's the case. And that he might now be more than just a slave, an indentured servant to you, that he might be viewed by you as a brother. So verse 17, so if you consider me your partner, of course he would. But notice the humility of Paul. If you would consider us equal, if you would consider us fellow laborers in the vineyard of the Lord, receive him as you would receive me. Now, whoa, 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 wait, 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 time out. Paul, Paul, let's take a full time out. Let's process what you're asking me to do. You're asking me to take somebody who broke the law, who hurt me financially, who ran away, probably would have stayed away if he hadn't come in contact with you. And now what you want me to do is you want to forgive, you want me to forgive him totally. Not only that, you don't want me to hold it against him and you want me to view him, that runaway slave, as an equal? Ding, ding, ding. Show him what he's won. And see, that's the hardest part about forgiveness. The, the, the compulsion, or not the compulsion, the feeling sometimes the of, of forgiving is that if I forgive this person, then somehow I've lost. Then somehow they've scored more points on the board than I have. And that if, that if I forgive that person, then that means they win and I lose. Paul says that when you forgive... Both people win. Because that person receives the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ that they deserve. And then you are no longer controlled by that person's actions. We understand that, right? That when you don't forgive somebody and you're not willing to forgive somebody and I'm not willing to forgive somebody, that we have just given that person the right to control our mindset and our attitude. Now, I don't know about you, but the only person that I want to control my mindset and my attitude is the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't want anybody else to do that. So part of the incentive to forgive is to ensure that that person sees Jesus in your actions, but also that you don't let somebody control who you are and how you act and what you think. Some people, both in the church and outside the church, spend years being controlled and manipulated by something that happened so long ago by people they may not ever see again. All because forgiveness didn't take place. Because forgiveness was not in the cards 
of their faith. And so he says, if he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to who? Philemon. No. Charge that to who? Onesimus. Nope. Whatever he owes you for the work that he hasn't done, charge it to my account. What? Paul goes to the extreme here. I mean, you think about it. You think about how the way money was gained back in the day. It wasn't, uh, hey, I've got a fixed income or Paul was on a salary. Paul said, I earn however many tents I sell today. So from day to day, that might vary. There might be a day where Paul says, sells zero tents. There might be a day where Paul says, tw sells 20. But he says, hey, I'm gonna take a risk. I'm gonna take a step out. And I'm gonna say, whatever he owes you, charge it to my account. Because I'm gonna go to the extreme measure to see to it that Onesimus and Philemon are reconciled. And so that says something about being a third party in the process of forgiveness. How far are we willing to go? How far are we willing to walk with people to see to it that reconciliation happens? We should be people who shock people at how far we're willing to walk with them down the path to forgiveness. Because that's the demonstration of Jesus. That's the demonstration of Paul. And that should be the demonstration of people in the church. And he says in verse 19, you know, Justin, I find this a little bit, a little bit funny because you can imagine Philemon reading this, you want me to charge what to your account? And Paul says in verse 19, I, Paul, write this with my own hand. So just in case you think somebody else is writing this thing, just in case you think this might be a misprint, I just want to reassure you, I'm the one writing it. I will repay it to say nothing of your own owing me even your own self yes brother i want some benefit from you in the lord what's the benefit the benefit is reconciliation with anisimus he didn't ask for anything physical he wants the joy of knowing that two people who were once separate are now together that two brothers who were once departed from one another are now one again and he says, I want some benefit in your Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Forgiveness refreshes people. When people hear about the stories of redemption and people hear about the stories of forgiveness and people hear the stories of restoration, it refreshes the heart of the saints. It refreshes the heart of God. Verse 21, confidence of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more then what I say, Philemon, I know who you are, man. I know who you are down to your core. Essentially, Paul's saying, out of all the people that I know in your area, I probably know you the best. And it's not that I know that you're just gonna do the right thing. You're gonna go above and beyond what I ask. Because he understood that Philemon's faith had forgiveness as a central tenet of it. It was a pillar of who Philemon was. And if we're gonna have a biblical faith, then forgiveness also has to be that pillar. And this doesn't mean that forgiveness is easy or that we should be flipping about forgiveness. There's some times where, where, where being a forgiving person and to forgive people can be hard and it can be tough. This isn't romanticizing forgiveness. Forgiveness of sins on the cross was a tough thing by Jesus Christ. But the joy set before him, he endured the cross. There's joy that's found in forgiveness even amidst the pain of sometimes forgiving people for extremely wrong things that they've done to you me and he says at the same time prepare a guest room for me for I'm hoping that through your prayers I'll be graciously given to you and so in the final greeting he says Epaphras my fellow prisoner in Christ sending greetings to you so do Mark Aristarchus Demas Luke my fellow worker the grace of the Lord Christ be with your 
spirit. He starts the book with grace, calls upon Philemon to enact grace through his forgiveness, and then reminds Philemon that he has grace at the end of the book. That is not a coincidence. So this evening, the question is very simple for you and for me. When you look at your circumstances, your situations, when you reflect back on your life, when you look at your family, when you look at the people that you work with, who needs forgiveness? Because we can't say that we're Christians and we can't say that we have a Christian faith if we're not a forgiving people. Maybe this evening you're the one that needs to be forgiven for an action, for a deed, for a thought, for something that you said, or for maybe even the neglect of some of those spiritual disciplines. Maybe you need to be forgiven for not being forgiving. If that's the case, let's take care of that this evening as we stand and as we sing.